We're live. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another Poultry Keepers 360 live stream. We're glad you joined us tonight. We are going to be talking about poultry necropsies, the why and the how, coming up in just a minute. And welcome back. Here we are all smiling. Good to see Jeff. Good to see Karen. Um, good to see so many of you commenting this this afternoon on or evening. Uh, it's still light here, so that kind of screws me up, even though it is 7 o'clock. We're going to try something a little bit different tonight. We've got a video we want to use uh, to show you how to do a simple poultry necrop to you. Uh, this was done by Dr. Jackie Jacobs, who's uh, a poultry extension specialist at the University of Kentucky, and she does some good work. She she specializes specializes in uh, backyard flocks, so she's up to speed on that for sure. And the gentleman actually doing the necropsy is Dr. David Frame, uh, DVM. He's an associate professor at Utah State University. So the way this is going to work tonight, we're going to play some video. And if you have a question, post it anytime. We will pause the video, answer your questions, and then restart. Or not we won't restart the video, but we'll uh, play the video from where we stopped. And uh, it's, it's not a terribly long video. It's about 40 minutes. But uh, I think you're going to find it interesting. This is one of the better videos that I've seen on um, how to actually do a necropsy. Um, and so I'm going to give my cautionary warning here that this is graphic content night. So if, if you're a little squeamish about that, uh, avert your eyes. So, <laughs> and I, Jeff, why, why is it important for us to do necropsies? Well, it, I talk to a lot of people that, you know, they're having different health issues and I ask them, you know, have you opened up a bird, right? If you have a fresh dead bird, open it up, look for anything that's abnormal, right? And a lot of people have never opened up a chicken. They don't know what's inside their feathered friends. And so we're going like, to get to watch somebody else do a bird. So nobody had to sacrifice, but you know, to get really good help from a professional, Opening a bird up, especially if it's a mysterious death that doesn't have a lot of symptoms, opening the one up, taking pictures as you go in the different stages and get close ups of the livers. And, you know, so if you want to contact me, send me the pictures and say, hey, I had three hens die last night and I don't know why. And I did a fresh necropsy on them this morning. This is what I found. Right. And it's very helpful. Right. And instead of people trying to explain to us sometimes what they think happened or, you know, the little bits and pieces of the puzzle, you know, pictures really help a lot. So, I got a question for Jeff before we start. Oh, yeah. Oh. It's called amino acid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, one of those shirts. I love them. I love them. And then Karen has a question. Yes. Um, she had a hen die a, I'm going to say a few weeks ago. Is it too late to open her up now to see why she died? It is. So a lot of the soft tissue inside changes hourly or a minute, minute by minute. So if we lose, we we'll lose a lot of the picture, like liver tissue, for instance, and you'll see what a liver looks like inside. But, um, you know, of a fresh, freshly, you know, uh, euthanized bird. So, <clears throat> you know, liver tissue, for instance, will change colors very rapidly. Uh, lungs will also be really quick to change. So if it was a respiratory problem, you know, getting in there to look at the lungs to see what color they are, etc. you know, so the fresher, the better. And, you know, even, sometimes it's actually worth you know, in larger flocks, um, it's actually worth sometimes euthanizing 
you know, a bird that has symptoms and, you know, while it's still warm and doing this. And I'm not trying to sound gross, okay? I'm just trying to, um, but in all honesty, if something comes into your flock and, you know, it's taken them out and we can't diagnose it based on external symptoms, you know, taking one out, taking one for the team <clears throat> and opening it up can be very useful. And that's, if you send one off to a state lab, that's what they're going to do. And whenever, if you ever send a bird to like a state veterinary or a college lab, they prefer a live bird that is exhibiting the symptoms so they can euthanize it and the tissues are all fresh, right? Because every hour, every hour matters at looking at organs. Now, uh, Jeff, I'm going to add to what you said just a little bit, but I know when I did the first necropsy on a bird, it was a long time ago, but uh, I, I couldn't seem to find anything wrong with the bird, but it helped me to understand where the different internal organs were. Um, and, and so even if you can't figure out what caused the bird to, to go to the great roost in the sky, um, it's worthwhile doing a necropsy or two, just A, so you get comfortable with doing them, and B, so you have an understanding of um, what you're dealing with in, in, in doing this necropsy. And, and Karen, I want to put you on the spot here, but um, I, I know you, you've done necropsies on your birds. The first time you did it, did you find it difficult to do, or I mean, identifying the different body organs? Difficult. So I wouldn't say difficult, but I mean, yes. What are you looking at? It just takes, if you haven't done, now if you've done processing before, you know, just literally for meat, you know, you've seen the insides a lot, but you don't really pay much attention to them. You just grab them out and throw them away. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, so it's not hard, but yeah, figuring out where everything is. And then it's just shocking. Do you know what I mean? Like, where are the lungs? That's weird. Why would you put the lungs there? Do you know what I mean? Like, or, you know, the, the egg, the, you know, the female anatomy, that's pretty cool. Um, but I was, as you all know, just we're continually shocked about how fat they are. <laughs> so, I mean, you can also see, you know, just that um, other stuff, you know, or how much is in their crop. You know, if you're you know doing somebody with who you didn't even think, you don't think to yourself, wow, this is an impacted crop. That's not why I'm opening this bird up. But then when you do, you're like, wow, I pulled out, you know, an entire handful of <laughs> stuff. And that was not visible from the outside. Do you know what I mean? Like, so just the things you find out. Yeah. So I tell you what, do we have any other questions, Karen? I haven't seen any pop up here. Um, why don't we go ahead and launch the video? Yeah. And like I said, if, if you see something you don't understand or it, it pops a question in your mind, post it and we'll pause the video and answer it right there. Um, the only thing we were going to warn them is that the sound isn't very loud. Um, and But I do think it gets better along the way. So, all right. My name is Dr. Jackie Jacob. I am the coordinator for the Small and Backyard Flocks Community of Practice on eExtension, which is the uh, National Cooperative Extension Services online uh, extension programming. Um, every month we try to have a different webinar on a variety of topics of interest to small and backyard flock owners. Um, I'm also a, uh, an extension specialist at the University of Kentucky. Our uh, presentation for today is going to be on how to perform a simple avian necropsy. And Dr. David Frame, a veterinarian from Utah State University, will be doing the presentation. Um, this is being recorded. And um, if you have any questions, please put them in either the webinar chat area or in the Q&A, um, and we will uh, make sure your questions get answered. If the question um, is relevant to what Dr. Frame is talking about at that particular period of time when it's asked, 
I will pop in and uh, inter interrupt him. So David, if you see me pop up, that means there's a question. Um, if not, I will stay silent and hold the question till the end. So um, David, it's all yours. I'm going to go on mute and uh, let you take over. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Okay, I finally figured it out. Okay. Well, thanks, Jackie. Um, my name is David Frame. I'm the um, extension poultry specialist for Utah State University. I am also a veterinarian and a diagnostician with the um, Utah Veterinary Diagnostic Laboratory. And my goal there, and actually my, my uh, job is to uh, do the poultry work that comes into our laboratory. And so today, what we're going to visit about is, is looking to, to open up a bird and um, be able to hopefully, at the end of this thing, the objective is that you'll know what normal looks like so that um, if you see anything abnormal, you don't necessarily need to know what that is. You just need to know that you need to uh, probably have that looked at by a by an expert to, in order to find out what your problem is. Now this is going to be geared more towards the the, the small flock owner today, um, simply because if if it's a pet bird, you know one necropsy on a pet bird isn't really going to tell you a lot, and you'd probably either want um, a, a qualified veterinarian to look at that, or else uh, you know you, you just get another pet bird. But uh, what we're talking about is uh, uh, maybe the, the small farm flock uh, that uh, will have a, a certain amount of mortality. And as unfortunate as it is, when you raise chickens or, or any types of, of birds, there's going to be a certain amount that are going to, uh, to pass away at, a, at any given time. And so if you start seeing a bunch of them, then that's when you better start uh, looking at it to see if there's any kind of a disease problem involved there. The um, objectives then are really kind of to become familiar with the basic anatomy of the chicken and learn how to properly open it up, not only so that you can look at everything, but also so that you can keep yourself um, safe. Uh, we're talking about bio safety here and, and biosecurity. And then also just to become familiar with what normal organs and tissues in a bird look like. It's obviously not to become a, an avian expert or diagnostician, just, to, just so that you can see what the normal is so that if you do see something that is abnormal, uh, for instance, the liver doesn't look right, it's a different color or it's got spots on it or something that uh, you know that the, the normal shouldn't have, then you can um, find the proper diagnostic help at your local diagnostic laboratory or with your veterinarian. Now birds come in a variety of different shapes and sizes. Up here we have a pigeon a skeleton and over here we have a, a goose skeleton and you can appreciate that uh, there are some differences in anatomy there. The uh, neck is much longer than a goose. You have a much larger sternum or breastbone in a pigeon. And some of the, the long bones are. Yes, Jeff, oh, hold on. Jeff, you're muted still, but did you have a question? No, sorry, one of my employees walked in and oh. we're going to, <laughs> yeah. So, oh. Sorry, I was trying to run them off. Okay, all right, sorry about that. All right, keep playing. A little differently shaped too, but um, generally speaking, all birds have similar types of anatomy. Today, we're going to look specifically at the the chicken, and um, and that's what most most folks will have as small flocks, either for uh, this is a meat type chicken, or if you have small flocks for layers. Uh, 
where you uh, sell eggs maybe at a farmer's market or something like that. The, the tools are really very simple. Um, all you need is a sharp knife and I emphasize sharp. You wanna make sure that uh, you can, when you're ready to cut, it's gonna cut. And um, there's, a, there's a variety of uh, shears that are available um, that really work well. They're just sort of like uh, fortified scissors and uh, they'll cut through the, the bones and the ribs and things like that, that uh, normal scissors won't cut through. And so if you can find yourself um, a set of those, that's gonna help out uh, a lot in, in being able to have it uh, work a lot easier for you. And then just um, some tissue scissors of some sort. Um, you can buy these at instrument supply companies. And, um, and then some, some uh, forceps, we call them. They look sort of like tweezers, don't they? But we call them forceps. And if you can get ones with mouse toothed ends on that, that'll grab the tissue, uh, that'll work even better. And so you can kind of use that as an extension of your, of your fingernails or of your hand to be able to, to move things around. So it's really not that, um, that much uh, equipment that you, that you need. Um, sometimes a wooden block of some sort might help that uh, will allow you to uh, cut down onto it so you don't cut into something metal with your, your knife and, and uh, dull the edge or something like that, but um, very simple type material. So if we're gonna talk a little bit now about um, how to necropsy a bird, but the first and foremost thing is, is to protect yourself. Um, there's not a lot of diseases that can be transferred from uh, birds to human beings, but there are some. And so you wanna take care in, in making sure you protect yourself and those around you as best you can uh, if you're opening a, a bird up. So that entails All right, Rip, here's your knowledge. Everybody out there is wanting to know, what kind of chicken do you think that is? Uh, my guess is based on the body and the color of white legger. Young? Old? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> kind of hard for me to tell, but okay. I don't think it's mature, that's for sure. But how young, I don't know. I was thinking that it looked younger than, than sexually mature. Maybe we'll find out when we get to the... Uh, reproductive system. <laughs> All right. Sorry. So, um, putting some gloves on, some waterproof gloves of some sort, and you can use um, the type that you get like uh, for washing dishes, or you can get more fancy and, and buy a box of latex gloves or, or non-latex gloves, either one, um, to be able to, to wear so that you can um, uh, touch things without getting um, wet and blood and everything all over you. So that that's very important. Some people like to wear a, a mask. I don't think that's necessarily um, critical. Um, however, one thing that will help keep down dust and dander and things like that is to uh, wet the feathers down with a little liquid dish soap and moisten with water before you, you start. And you can maybe use a little scrub brush to scrub through those feathers and and, uh, and get them wet so that they, they kind of compact and the, and the dander doesn't fly all over the place. And it just makes not only more biosecure, but it makes it so you can see things a lot better too without having feathers flying around in, inside what you're trying to look at. So we got the bird on, on its back on a, on a cutting surface of some sort. And this is um, the position that you'd want, want that bird laid in. Now it's gonna continue to fall over to one side and the other if you uh, start just nilly willy hacking away at it. So you want to uh, try to stabilize that a little bit. And by doing, um, by flaying the, the um, legs out, that kind of gives it a, a place to stand too. So um, as you're doing this, you just kind of cut the soft tissue with a knife here so that um, the legs will fall down and then just kind of pry them apart so that the, the joint of the, the femur up here comes out of the socket and then spread the legs so that they lie flat. Uh, then you can start uh, working on, on other, other things. It's just a close up of one leg where you can see the femoral head has come out of the socket 
and it uh, it'll hold the leg down. If you don't get that out of the socket, uh, it'll just kind of spring back up. Um, just kind of use a knife to get down around it, and then just kind of put your hand on the back of the the leg and and pry it a little bit. Be careful that you don't break bones or anything that might uh, that might uh, cut through your gloves or or um, give you a cut there. But it is it does come out pretty pretty simple. So once you get that out, now you've got your legs down, and uh, just take the knife and kind of flay the the skin back off the, the breast, and you can take um, a, a hand, usually I'll take the left hand uh, to be able to grab that skin and just kind of peel it back the rest of the way to leave the, uh, the breast open. And, and at this point, you want to look at that breast and see, does that look like a normal uh, amount of muscles on the on there? Um, is it really dark? Is it um, has it got any kind of uh, abnormal spots or um, discoloration in it? And did the skin peel off carefully or easily? If it uh, is really hard and the muscle is kind of kind of um, dry, uh, well, probably that bird was dehydrated. And so that's one thing it'll tell you there. On the previous slide, we can see up here that, that there's the crop, and that's the the uh, part of the digestive organ that uh, is tied in with the esophagus, and that's where the the bird will store feed to kind of soften it before it goes down the rest of the the gastrointestinal tract. And you want to look at that and uh, make sure that that's all kind of normal. Now this normal this crop is normal. You notice it hasn't got any feed in it, so this bird hasn't hasn't been eating. You know in the, in the um, uh, within a little bit before it died. Um, it's, it's full of air, but you can see that how thin that, that crop surface is, and it doesn't look like it's uh, really thick or have any kind of discoloration on it. Um, sometimes they'll get uh, some fungal infections in there and it'll make that crop look like a, kind of, we call it kind of Turkish towel look to it. But um, here's a normal crop. That's what it would look like. It's right in the, in the area between the two uh, halves of the breast, um, where those bones come up, and uh, take a look at that to make sure everything's okay. Then cut into it, and if there is feed in there, make sure it's normal type stuff. Um, not a lot of weeds or um, rocks or things that obviously shouldn't be there. So that's a good thing to look at. Now what I like to do is uh, turn the bird around and start working from the the head area down. And one of the reasons I do this for, from a diagnostic standpoint, is that uh, this is the clean end of the bird. And so if there's any kind of uh, cultures that I need to take um, further down the road on the liver or other internal organs, I haven't messed the intestines up and inadvertently cut them or anything like that to kind of, kind of contaminate things. So I like to start up here. I like to open the bird by uh, going down the right side of the, um, the beak and you just use your scissors and cut down through there. Uh, try, to keep, try to keep that as close to the surface of the skin as possible as you cut and cut parallel down the neck. And what it'll end up doing is, is opening up the, the neck area here where it'll show uh, two things that you're, you want to look for. The esophagus, and that's the part of the the digestive tract that uh, they swallow, the bird will swallow the feed into, and then it'll work its way down into the crop, and the crop would be further down there. Then the other thing is is the trachea, and of course that's where um, the chicken breathes through, and the air goes down into its um, bronchi and into its lungs. And they're the two things you want to look at to make sure they're okay. Um, try not to cut into this into the trachea if you can help it, um, mainly because you'll cut into it later and you want to know what what you're cutting so that you can see it. So here we have the trachea that's still closed and then the esophagus. And this is a normal esophagus. It's got kind of a glistening mucus look to it. And you can see these little um, darker areas and their glands uh, within the esophagus. Uh, with vitamin A deficiency, you know, you'll start seeing a lot of uh, rough looking white thickened esophagus and um, and so you, anything that doesn't look like this may 
may be an indication of some some type of problem. Um, it, it's rare that the esophagus will show much, but um, on occasion, uh, particularly if they're exposed to to uh, a vitamin deficiency or something, you can see a, a problem there. So now next, what you want to do is cut into the, the trachea. Just use that scissors and just kind of cut along there. And this is a beautiful trachea here. You want it to be clear. That you, there may be a little bit of glistening on the trachea, but you, there's not mucus in there. There's no uh, yellowish material. There's no um, cheesy stuff or th that has broken off that um, indicates that there's some uh, ne necrosis going on in there. And you'll notice these faint red areas are the tracheal rings. And this is cartilage in, inside the trachea. And this is what you want to look, you want to see is little to no coloration in those, um, in those rings. With some diseases, you'll, you'll see a, a severe reddening of the tracheal um, lining as well as these, these areas will, will, be, will stand out a lot more too. So this is, uh, this is a beautiful trachea right here. This is what you want to see. Now, once you uh, look at the upper respiratory th tract, one thing that I, I failed to, to mention, and let's, let's go back here a little bit too, is um, um, just take a knife and cut into those sinuses right there. Make sure there's not, um, not any kind of cheesy material in there, that the eye is not swollen or the area around the eye. And, um, and then also that there's no, no discharge, not a lot of um, mucus coming out of the, the nostrils. And uh, that can indicate some um, some problems, so you want to watch that. So after you look at the head area, let's get into the um, get under the hood and look at the organs. And you, you'll take your uh, shears and kind of cut down the rib cage on both sides, and then you'll probably have to cut it off the the bone right here in order to retract that whole breast. Um, part of it, but you retract that off to the left and then just leave it there somewhere so that um, it's out of the way. Then this will expose things to you. Now, in this particular slide, what we can see is, uh, first of all, we can see the, the, the uh, end of the trachea coming down, and that will eventually go into the lungs, which are on both sides. There's a lung right there, and uh, there's one on the, on the left, on the right side, too. The lungs in chickens are a lot different than lung than our lungs. Um, you know, ours is more like a balloon. We inhale and it expands, and um, and then it uh, it gives a negative pressure down there, and then then of course we exhale. Um, chickens don't have diaphragms, and so the um, partial pressure of both the abdomen and the thorax is the same. So they have to breathe a different way, and they actually breathe by um, moving this this breast um, bone with certain muscles back and forth like bellows. But these lungs are up inside the rib cage. They're not just out there. And uh, they don't expand and contract like ours do. And so they're going to be there all the time. And, and one thing that, that often happens with uh, certain uh, diseases is that it gets down inside those lungs and then it causes, causes them to, to kind of consolidate and, uh, and get, a, get a pneumonia. And so... Uh, that's where they are. We'll, we'll see a better picture of them here in a minute. Also in this slide, we can see the heart. It's nested very nicely between two lobes of the liver. And then down below, we can see something sticking out right there, and that's our gizzard. So that's the, uh, the organ that grinds the feed. And, um, and if you buy a turkey or, or sometimes even a chicken, uh, they'll, they'll keep the 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 giblets in there, and that's part of that, that giblet package that you see. So in order to get into this thing without causing a lot of problems, um, birds will have air sacs, and they're very, very uh, thin tissues that actually hold the air before they, before they go into the lung. And, um, and along the, the left side, there's going to be an air sac right there that you want to detach that tissue and then any other kind of connecting stuff um, and do it with a finger so you, you don't take a knife and cut something uh, that you don't want to cut so that you can just kind of bluntly dissect that and get that out of the way. And then you just kind of lay everything off 
to your left. Uh, you can see that I've got a hold of the gizzard right there. And in the next slide, all that's been laid over so you can kind of see the inside. Now remember the, the heart was nested in between those liver lobes. You can still see the liver lobes over there. That's been moved over. Um, you can see the, the lung is deep inside the rib cage right there now. So now we have a good view of some of the other organs. And the esophagus will eventually go into this organ, which is called the proventriculus. And that's like the true stomach of the bird. And then the, the, um, the feed eventually will, will uh, go down into the gizzard and then further down into the intestinal tract here. Intestinal tract of birds is very short compared to uh, mammals, uh, particularly things like uh, horses and, and cows, which have a really long one. And so it's just amazing how efficient um, chickens can be in using their feed and, and actually converting it to either meat or to eggs. So once you get that open, you can see part of the air sac right here. It's just kind of a film. That's the way you want to see it. If it's um, if it's got a lot of, if you can't see through it, or even if you can't read newspaper through it, then it's too thick. Uh, also, sometimes you'll get a lot of uh, vasculation in there where you'll see blood vessels forming, and that's indication that it's uh, inflamed. And so something's going on with the respiratory system of the bird if you see that type of thing. Um, the spleen should be about a third of the size of the proventriculus length. This one's a little bit larger than that, but it's it, it looks normal. So that's not a, I, I don't see anything wrong here, but uh, uh, that spleen, if it looks like it's uh, plum colored, or if it's got a lot of um, white spots in it, uh, or if it's really enlarged, then it's, it's becoming like the whole whole length of that thing or even two thirds of the length and that means that there's an infection going on in there. So spread open the abdominal cavity. And now we've got the abdominal cavity spread open and we're going to look at a few uh, organs in here. If you remember uh, this, this chicken had a very small comb way, way back when we started opening the, the beak. And uh, that means that it uh, wasn't in lay. And so it could have either been, uh, this was actually a young pullet and that's the reason it wasn't in lay. But um, uh, we'll see that the ovary down here, and we'll see this in another slide too, that's the ovary of the chicken is, uh, is, not, is not active. But uh, first of all, let's look at some of these other organs. The heart is up here. Uh, it has a sac around it, it's called the pericardium. And that sac should be clear. Um, it shouldn't have a lot of fluid in it. It's going to have a little bit because that, that lubricates the heart as it beats. But if that is, is um, really opaque, if it looks white, if it's got uh, stuff that looks like grit on it, uh, uh, these are indications that something's wrong with the, with the pericardium and you've got an infection of some sort on there. The liver should be about this color. Now, there's quite a lot of variation in normal livers. Uh, as far as color goes, but um, if the edges are not really sharp, like this edge is, um, if it's really a, an abnormally uh, red liver, uh, cherry red liver type thing, or if it's abnormally dark, or if it's mottled, these are indications that uh, there's some pathology going on in the liver. It also has a, a covering over it, and it's uh, normally really, really uh, transparent and sometimes you'll get uh, you'll get some diseases that'll cause a white cheesy type stuff to come over the top of that. So now we have our proventriculus and if you remember that's the true stomach that's where it has the enzymes that'll start the digestion in the in the bird and then it goes down into the the gizzard and this is where the grinding takes place and uh, so the chicken will eat to small pieces of limestone or even rocks sometimes, uh, pebbles, and they'll lodge down in here and help uh, act as kind of the teeth as it grinds the feet. Uh, this spleen, you can see, is not as uh, normal colored as the one that we saw before. It, it may or may not have a problem. It's about half the size of the proventriculus. But um, if you do see any kind of a spotty type spleen like that, that might be an indication of a 
of an infection. And then down here we see the conglomeration of the intestines where they fit. Now there's three lobes to the kidneys and there are these brown areas and there's, there's a kidney on each side. So if we were to move all this out of the way, we would be able to see that on this side, there's an identical um, set of three lobes of kidneys along that side. You want to look at that? This is the normal color of a kidney. Sometimes it'll have a little mottled look, um, it, and that could be normal, uh, but if it's uh, excessive, it could mean it's uh, dehydrated. It could mean that there's uh, some gout going on and um, or some other types of problems, but this is a normal color that you would see with a kidney. So now we're kind of looking at this stuff from from a, a little different angle. This is a beautiful picture of a lung. That's the kind of lung you want to see. It's pink. It, you can see the, the sponginess to it. And if you were to, to shell that out of the, the body cavity and put it in some water, it would float to the surface. It's, uh, it, it has no consolidation to it uh, whatsoever. And um, then off to the side, we can see what we saw before. And you can see that the air sac uh, covering is is pretty good. Most of that is just the camera that's showing that uh, real cloudiness there. And uh, the ovary I talked about before. What's interesting about ovaries is that um, every um, egg that the chicken will ever lay is actually somewhere, somewhere present in that ovary at the time of hatch. And so it just depends on, um, you know, when they're stimulated uh, to, to mature, then those those uh, yolks will start forming. And there's plenty of them, over 10,000. So you never have to worry about your, your chicken running out of uh, eggs, yolks for eggs. Here's the, the kidney again that's nested right up inside the, the body cavity, a uh, good looking kidney. Now let's take the intestinal system out so you can kind of get an idea of what to, what it is. Now, the esophagus would be up here, and then if you even followed it further up, you would see the, the crop coming off of it, but I've taken that off. And here's the, the proventriculus, the true stomach, as it goes into the gizzard. Um, there's muscles in there, smooth muscles, that will grind that feed and get it, um, get it to the point where it can start to be digested, and it'll go up the ascending and descending loops of the, of the duodenum excuse me, and um, that's where digestion really starts there. Now, I just wanna make a point here that the pancreas, which um, gives some enzymes out, uh, digestive enzymes is in between the loops of the duodenum. Pancreas is also where the insulin is, is formed um, for sugar digestion too. So um, that's a normal, looking pancreas, a lot of times it'll be a, a lot paler than that. It'll look kind of pinkish. If it looks white and chalky looking, uh, that's an indication that there's pancreatitis going on, inflammation of the pancreas, and there, there's some problems there. Um, and then we follow up through the intestinal tract. And by the way, that's the gallbladder. The, the liver's been taken off here, but the gallbladder uh, will actually um, put the bile into the system, which helps in fat digestion. So if if by chance you open a, a bird up and the gallbladder is quite large and it's gonna be, be kind of a, a greenish or blue color, and you'll see it right uh, nested next to the, to the liver, um, a lot of times that indicates that the, the chicken hasn't eaten recently because the, it hasn't uh, pushed any bile into the system. So that's one thing you can kind of look at to see if the if it's been eating along with the crop, if there's feed in it, and, and also if there's feed in the rest of the digestive tract. But as it goes down, uh, we see a normal uh, small intestine here. And it goes down into uh, a, a place where there's three things that come together. And um, these blind pouches are called cica. It, they are very variable in look too, uh, particularly the inside of them. Uh, usually it'll be kind of a dark brownish looking stuff uh, it can be green looking, and uh, depending on if there's the sequel content has been uh, expelled recently, there can be quite a lot of it in there. And so you might uh, cut into that sequel and have a lot of stuff come out of there, and you wonder, ooh, 
uh, what's going on here? And, and oftentimes it's, um, it doesn't smell too good either. So um, usually if there's a problem with a Sika, it's going to be, um, there's, it's going to be really hard and cheesy type stuff in there, or it's going to be really um, um, possibly runny and that type of thing. But um, a normal Sika content will be green a lot of the times and it, and it has a smell to it. So that doesn't necessarily mean that something's wrong. Um, chickens don't have pyrus patches as uh, mammals do. Pyrus patches are a conglomeration of, of uh, lymphoid tissues uh, throughout the, the gut, and that helps in immunity. But what they do have is is these what they call sequel, sequel tonsils right at this juncture here, and um, it's called the ileocecal junction. Junction. Normally they're they're kind of pinkish colored, um, but if you see a lot of um, hemorrhage in the, that area. And, or they, they look really swollen and, and kind of grape-like, then that's an indication that they, they, have a, uh, they could have a, a bad viral disease of some sort. Then we come down to the end. Uh, I thought I had a picture of the cloaca, but uh, the cloaca at the end here is, um, is the common port of uh, embarkation, I guess you could call it, of the, of the urinary system, the digestive tract, and the um, and also the reproductive tract of the bird, and and uh, there's a another really interesting organ that's called the bursa fabricius right here on that um, uh, it's above the cloaca it's on uh, dorsal to it, and um, this is also a, a place where the chicks will be exposed a lot of the times their first exposure to um, um, disease, antigens, uh, other things that will will uh, cause a response that the bird will produce antibodies to. And uh, so this kind of helps helps in, um, in the immune process. But the interesting thing is, is that there's a, a particular type of cell called the B cell. And um, it's named after the birth of Fabricius and, and even in, in mammals and, and in us that uh, we have these B cells and it's named that even though we obviously don't have a birth. So now we, we come into um, a chicken that this particular one is, is more into the production end of things. Um, there are the, these ovaries, these ova that are expanding and uh, the yolk of course is inside and they will be deposited into the oviduct and then of course down and um, in a way they'll, they'll go um, and be laid. You can kind of see down here, it's almost out of the picture and I hadn't noticed that until just now, but there's a, a cystic ovary. Um, the left oviduct in the chicken is the one that's active. And so on the right side, um, there's not an active oviduct. It usually doesn't form, it's just kind of vestigial. In this particular case, and, and this occurs quite frequently in chickens, uh, that that will form will fill with water and form kind of a cyst. In fact, sometimes it can get so large that it'll almost fill the the whole um, salomic cavity there, the abdominal cavity, and um, and so if you see something like that that's coming off the the distal end here of the chicken um, tract, that's what it probably is. So yeah, that's something that you'll see eventually if you open up enough chickens. Uh, this is the healthy oviduct here. Um, of course, that's where the albumin is put on and then down further the, the, the eggshell. And if we were to tease that out, this is kind of what it looks like. You've got your, your ovary and then these are ova or the, the eggs that will eventually um, fall down into this into the oviduct itself, and um, and like I say, once they come into to uh, sexual maturity, they'll start. These things will start expanding, and here we have ones that are, are ready to go. And, um, and so as they as they mature, you notice that they have a, have these um, capillaries around them, and so that's normal. But they have an area that's that's called the stigma, and that'll actually break open, and the yolk will. will come out and fall into the, the oviduct through the infundibulum. And once in a while, these capillaries will break and, and that's what will give you the, your um, blood spots in your eggs that you'll 
eventually see if you raise enough eggs in your backyard. So um, this is a normal ovary. And um, the, I put this picture in here to remind me that um, always look at the, uh, the vent area. And this is the vent of the chicken. Um, to, to see if it's been picked, if there's any kind of parasites on there. Uh, you can look at this before you even start cutting into the bird, just uh, after you've washed it off, just to turn it over and look at it. And uh, you'll notice that there's, there's quite a lot of coloration, uh, yellow coloration in this particular vent area. And that's telling us that this chicken has not been laying eggs lately. Now this is a legger and so they, they will have uh, yellow skin, and so this is uh, telling us that uh, that pigment has not really disappeared there. And we're not going to talk about the lace cycle here, but uh, that's one thing that you'll see in yellow skinned uh, breeds. One thing I want to mention too is that um, it's always a good idea to kind of look at the bones in the chickens and to see how things look. And there's a, a good area right here joint that you want to cut into. In fact, uh, when you take your whole chicken home and cut in into it, uh, that's cutting off the thigh and the drumstick. So that, that's that uh, joint right there that you want to look at. So just take your knife and, and um, kind of cut there and then flex the leg enough that you can see where that joint is and then cut right through there on an angle. And then that'll open that up. And then you just take your knife and slice off the top of the of the the bone and now we have the top part of the bone here and this is showing you the growth plate and this is normal bone spicules that are being formed and uh, that's what you want to see however particularly in uh, meat type chickens there are some abnormalities and i haven't shown any abnormalities in this particular um, video but i do want to uh, show you a couple here is that you can appreciate up here that something's wrong. You've got this big plug of tissue right here and there, that growth plate does not come smoothly across. This is called, um, well, this is all cartilage down here and it's uh, dyschondroplasia. Uh, it's uh, dysplastic cartilage that shouldn't be there. And this happens uh, sometimes uh, in fast growing birds such as broilers and, and, and turkeys. And it's on the inside of the, of the bone inside of the leg and it is very painful um, to the chicken and so if you if you see any that are limping and things like that you want to be sure and look at that see if there's any kind of a bone problem and what often happens is you get infection around that thing too now sometimes this will break off as the as the bird grows and form a, a an area inside the bone and then you'll get some osteomyelitis forming um, inside there. Uh, in real mild cases, a lot of times it'll just resorb and, and go away. But this is a pretty, this is a pretty uh, nasty uh, plug of cartilage in that bone and it's not just going to go away. So if you cut in there and, you, and this, this tissue is not um, very firm, it kind of breaks away and you can see these kind of whitish areas in there. Uh, that's uh, that's telling you that there's some bone infection going on. And uh, so that's kind of what, what you want to look at. So th these are abnormal and uh, this is the normal. So you want to make sure that uh, you have a good idea of what that looks like. This will usually be something you want to look at in, in growing birds. If you have adult hens, it's not necessary, but um, if you see any kind of limping or problems like that, it's always just a good idea to look. And, uh, if you, and I think that's pretty much uh, it as far as the general opening of a chicken and uh, looking for normal tissues. And so now, um, are there any questions? Okay, we're now gonna open it up to questions. That was a great presentation. All right, that's all. <laughs> <laughs> I found, I found, I'm not willing to let you all listen to the audio I have with this video, but after I'm willing to show to a two minute video of a real life old fat chicken at when I first went in, are you any, you want to see what a real, when it's not a baby chicken? <laughs> Do it. Okay. 
Wait, I gotta mute it because I don't know what we're saying. So, so she's a little fatter than the one we just did. Yeah. <laughs> um, her, I think, if I remember correctly, this one's uh, liver was a very weird color. Um, and it also had a mystery appendage that I never did figure out what it was. So maybe y'all can help me with that. There, I'm trying to remove the breast plate for good viewing. <laughs> um, so come on in. So that's not, let me pause. That's like, how do I pause? That's not really the right color. Right, Jeff? What's that? The liver? Yeah. Right. It's a little bit on the tan side, but it's a uniform tan color. And when I go in there, the lighter, more caramely looking it is, mm -hmm. um, as long as it's uniform, I, I'm not seeing spots or variations of color. Okay. Um, I, I, I usually go to fatty liver. Right. Okay. And, yeah. and this bird was between yeah. three and four, I think. Right. And with the amount of other abdominal fat that we've got in there. <laughs> and I'm not, look, I mean, it's just where you're going to go with this. Um, yeah. Look, it, it, if it's a uniform, lighter color, um, you know, and I've seen some that were almost tan in color versus red. I mean, mm -hmm. they were getting right up to the tan marker. Okay. Um, and they were... 50% larger than they should have been. Um, and the liver just actually crumbled in my hand, right? Fell apart. It had yeah. no, and that was just way too much fat, right? Yeah. And that I was from somebody that was feeding milk, free choice every day, the entire life of the bird, right? Uh, it They just can't process that much milk product, okay? It's more of that, you know, special treat, more of that, but it just... Anyway, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. I think I was probably looking at the edges of the liver there. I haven't decided if that's my arms or if I'm doing the video, but I think it's my arms. There's the heart. Had a little white spot on the end. I didn't know if that was normal. It is. Okay. <laughs> at the bottom of the pericardium, it's often white at the very tip. Okay. Um, as long as the majority of the sac is clear enough, you could read Yay. newspaper through it. Okay. They're in good shape, right? Um, <clears throat> when a bird dies of a heart attack, the heart muscle tone will be extremely flabby, right? Really jello like, and the pericardium sac will get uh cloudy, very milkyish, cloudy looking. Um, and there will tend to be a little bit extra fluid in there also when it dies of a heart attack. So, all right, so now this is the yolks, the ovary, obviously. <laughs> Um, but it was all inside of a sack, which I'm not sure I truly understood. Schmaltz factor. Yes, it's delicious. Are you doing any more this year, Karen? Do you know? I saved one bird to autopsy, a one-year-old, to see if she was any less fat this year. You don't have I any mean, old, old birds? Not that need killing. Okay. But... They would have been fat from before. Do you know what I mean? Like, I wanted one that I grew up since I did this autopsy to see if I managed to keep less fat on them. Okay. Got it. But there's a something green. I don't know what that is. <laughs> you think um, I know? I just watched it. The only thing green in there that close to the liver would have been the gallbladder. And okay. again, with that level of fat that she was carrying around. Yeah. Um, that gallbladder would have been stressed and would have been green, more green. Yeah. Look, she's still laying eggs, though. Yep. <laughs> yep there's her reproductive tract in in use as we speak. This was a March. This was in March, everybody. So last year. So there you go. There's the mystery organ. I don't know what it was. Organ or. What is that? Yeah, it's not close yeah. enough. I'd almost bet you it's a kidney. Yeah. It was sort of tied. I have a picture of it, but yeah, it was sort of tied there. Um, but that's the end of it, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> Just showing the. Yeah. 
Yeah. And Karen, we appreciate you sharing that with us. <laughs> well, I just um, just wanted to say, like, because you look at that video he did, and you're like, you think all the organs are going to be right there, all pretty, like his empty, young. <laughs> so they were a little bit harder to find and identify in a in an adult bird who's uh, been through a few years. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I'm not sure if I can show um, one. I'm not sure if I can show this picture or not. Window. This was, and Jeff is always talking about grit and grit, and but I think you in the end you told me that she didn't really have enough grit in her gizzard. Is that? Um. Actually, no. Uh, so when I open a gizzard, a good healthy gizzard will be fifty to sixty percent of, of the of the mass inside or the area going by area, not weight. Okay, fifty to sixty percent of that should be grit, <clears throat> and that's you're you're really close. Okay. Yeah. I think it might have been the year before that you said I needed to right. try to talk them into doing more grit. Um. <laughs> So your pictures brought up more questions than uh, okay. well, that's because everybody wants to know what. Well, how did I let him get that bad? Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. What's next? Uh, do we have any questions, Karen? I, I know you've been kind of tracking that. Um. Yeah. So John wanted to know if this was before I started managing the molt. Yes, and I will tell you that my managing the molt did not produce as wonderfully as I wanted it to. Um, so I actually had, I did have, I had a couple of birds that even lost multiple pounds, but my males all gained weight and some of my girls gained weight too on the mold diet. So I, Jeff doesn't believe me, but I did I not. Do, do I, a, I do believe you. I do not. I did not do a good enough job to get the weight off of them. So. <laughs> No. He didn't tell you to put them on that little treadmill thing he talks about sometimes. <laughs> nope. I did not do extra exercising. Um, and Cheryl asked, what was I feeding her? Uh, the properly formulated diet from Fertrell. <laughs> <laughs> and Perhaps here's too my, much here's, of it. Okay. Yeah. And here's my disclaimer is, you know what? I don't know. On, I, I know how to formulate a, a good a very good feed right but i don't know what the right amount is right for heritage type breeds or standard breeds i i have no there's no data i have nothing to go by right i know what to feed a commercial hen or what to feed a commercial broiler or you know in that environment i know exactly what to feed them but they're not the same bird right as what most of the people listening here tonight are, there's no data. I have, I don't, you know, uh, this is trial and error. I'm sorry, folks. I do not have that answer. So, and, and, um, I'm going to throw another little thing out there on that. You can run across, and I think University of Kentucky is where I found it, uh, some work they've done with heritage breeds, but, when you dig a little deeper, it became apparent that they were using heritage breed from hatcheries, which are totally different animals than standard bred birds. Totally different, right? And, and, not, and they're not they're not working with the standard bred birds, and that's that's why Karen probably had those issues. Um, you know, I'm sorry. Yeah. But I, and the amount that you feed and there's always that caveat this is where i think i've done wrong is i've always free fed them basically until they start laying so i believe i'm packing on the pounds in early. the very beginning in the early yeah so this year i did a little bit i tried to grow them in smaller batches and not not let them just go crazy until then so Kristen asked about, you know, she saw a uh, green bile green and I doubt it was actually from, um, I have no doubt that it's bile, but I wouldn't think that it's coming out of the gallbladder. Um, when he was talking about the two Sika glands, 
Um, I almost paused or asked you to pause the video to talk about it a little bit. Um, those are typically green and um, I've been in flocks. I've walked flocks, you know, again, commercial flocks, but I've seen where um, when the birds are running a temperature or a fever, I'll see a blunt, a bunch of really dark black, um, you know, droppings, right? Tarry looking. And so those cica glands on either side um, of the intestinal tract, when the bird has a fever, they'll dump, right? It'll, it'll cause the bird to dump those out and you'll see really black. And I think probably what uh, Kirsten <clears throat> was seeing is, is green out of the cica glands. Here's the cica glands of that bird. Wee! Dance! Did you open them up? Yep, right there. Yeah. I'm doing it. Like he yeah. said, usually when I've opened them up, they're usually uh, brown, you know, mostly brown, a little bit of green. You know, they're, they're kind of in that brown, green, black zone right there where all three of those colors come together. And that's what I feel is pretty normal to see. Um, he just said brown, but it's, yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry, we'll move that. All right, keep talking. What other questions? Speaking of standard bread. <laughs> well, Lori asked if they ate grit today, okay, how long does it stay in their system? If it, if it's the right size for the bird, um, like if you're feeding a layer of grit, which, you know, we showed pictures in previous uh, videos, but it's like three eighths of an inch long. I expect that to be in there for two to three weeks minimum. Could be in there as long as a month. So it, it's going to be in there. For, if you're using granite, A, which is one of the hardest stones out there uh, and the right size, it will be in there for a prolonged period of time. Um, typically what I see is in a mature laying hen, her desire for grit is somewhere um, right around three ounces, give or take a half an ounce per month. Okay, so she, she will want to eat somewhere around three ounces. For a four to five pound bird, could be a little bit more for a heavier bird. You know, so it's not, <clears throat> you know, it's not a huge amount. Uh, but you're looking at three to four pounds in the course of a year. And if they're going through more than that, that's probably an indicator that your grit size is not large enough or it's not hard enough, right? So um, if you're using granite, it should stay in there for about a month and three, three weeks to a month. And as long as it's the right size. All right. Chris, Kristen, 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 sorry. Kristen Kristen says he didn't show any testicles, which are quite something in chickens. Yeah. Um, well, there wouldn't be in laying hands, so yeah, I unless, just, unless it I was had, a special one. I had some testicle pictures, so that's where uh, that's in the bird, and then theirs was outside of the bird. So, um, but we have another testicle question here. Um, let's see, so. Sharna had a six-month-old Orpington cockerel whose testicle was half the size of the other testicle. It was also dark brown slash black at the bottom, covering about a quarter set. Could it have been a cancer? Um, I wouldn't go right to cancer. It could have been some sort of other necrosis going on in there. Um, something could have affected it even way back at chick stage, um, you know early 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 on something could have affected it it just didn't develop correctly you know could have been strangled didn't get enough blood flow could be a whole lot of things so don't just jump to cancer um i would be i think you should check that family line and future males to see if just to make sure it's not something genetic right and, and it's easier to sacrifice cockerels than it is you know pullets so and check that um, it, it, you know, the reason I suggested this to rip, <clears throat> you know, a week or so ago to have this is, 
you know, you folks need to know what normal is inside your birds. Um, I mean, you've seen what normal is, you know, in, in a commercial bird, but, you know, I don't want to encourage you to, when you're doing your culls um, throughout at all the different ages, you know, I, I would encourage you all to document it, right? Open up what, what you deem as a healthy bird, take pictures of the organs along the way, save it somewhere. So you have something to compare it to if a problem ever does come to your flock. But, <clears throat> you know, like the variation in testicle size is a perfect example. So well, and, and just for Rip, that's a six month old cockerel. I mean, it's old enough to be but I mean, it's still on the young side. Would you, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I would expect they would always be roughly the same size. I can't imagine that one testicle grows and then stops and then the other one grows and stops. That doesn't seem logical. Right. But They're going to grow simultaneously unless there's yeah. some sort of metabolic problem or, you know, <clears throat> uh, something else going on in there. So. And Cheryl, yes, all of my recipes have corn in them. So just an answer to Yes, there was corn. Um, um, well, just to pause for a second, not just corn causes fat. So okay. any carbohydrate, um, you know, wheat causes white fat, corn causes yellow fat, right? Um, your barley and your oats don't trigger as much fat formation. So folks listening, you know, I, I you'll see that I run the barley and the oats right up there as far as I can safely. And because they just do not convert to fat like your other cereal grains, you know, wheat, rye, triticale, corn, etc. Um, all right. Who who highlighted Bud Miller's question? I, I did. I, I'll okay. take that. Okay. Uh, Bud don't know. Speaking of standard bred birds, where can I find some pre 1950 genetics from Plymouth Bard Rock? Bud, um, you know, almost any breeder of exhibition barred rocks owes genetics predate 1950 easily. But I, I know what you're looking for. You're looking for birds that are very productive and lay lots and lots of eggs, 200 or so eggs per hen, or, or grow fast and, and would make good broilers. Sadly, uh, these standard bred exhibition birds, uh, standard bred birds that went down that exhibition trail, they didn't maintain the productive abilities of those barred rocks. Uh, it, it's going to take some breeding to get the production back up, no matter whether it's egg production or meat production. And I, I wanted to, I see this question pop up a lot on uh, a lot of the groups. You know, where can I find genetics from 60, 70 years ago? Uh, they're out there, uh, and but there are some barred rocks that would fit your bill if that's what you're interested in for production. You just have to dig around and, and search. Uh, if you can find somebody that has uh, some of Frank Reese's barred rocks, those would be good, uh, both for egg laying and uh, for meat production, but they're, they're hard to find and even harder to get folks to turn loose of them when, they, when you do find them. <laughs> Karen, do you remember anybody back in our old sustainable poultry days doing barred rocks? Not that still has them. Okay. Um, all right. So how about this? Anybody have any information on if you're vaccinating for Merix? Have you, anybody ever found any tumors? I've not run across anything on that, Jeff. Uh, look, I have... I, I have done necropsy on mature layers and broilers and have found uh, Merrick's tumors in both. Um, what I don't know, I have no idea if it goes back to, you know, is it tied to the vaccination or not? Um, if it was a live, if it was a live virus vaccine, I would be more concerned versus a killed. Um, but yeah, it's, I don't know if those flocks were vaccinated or not. I, the Cornish cross flock that I found it in was not initially and then started vaccinating for it. Um, so in meat variety birds, I find it shows up 
um, in the bird's right leg. If you're looking down on the bird from the top, um, more often than not, I see the lesion is on the sciatic nerve <clears throat> on the inner inside of the thigh. So when you're doing that necropsy, you cut the skin and then you use something like tongue depressors to pull the muscles apart until you get down near that. Um, I think it's the femur bone, <clears throat> but you'll find a white looks like dental floss kind of. It's a milky white string and that's the sciatic nerve. And I've seen brown tumors growing on it. And I've also seen perpendicular, very bright white rings growing around it, striations. Um, <clears throat> in the layers, I've always seen it up near the spine. So the bird just goes, she hunches up, she quits eating, she kind of wastes away. But if we get them, you know, early enough before they die and open them up, <clears throat> inside the body cavity, but right up next to the spine, you find dark brown, reddish brown, gelatinous tumors, um, you know, because Merix does affect the nervous system of the bird. So, but that's where I've seen it in sex link, um, production brown egg layers and Cornish cross. I have no idea if it's tied to the vaccine. So I've been to two in-person necropsy classes done by vets teaching us how to do it for the backyard. Mm -hmm. um, and both of them, they used golden comets or highline brown, you know what I mean? Like the- Right, the, commercial brown uh, layer, yeah. right? And both of them did them right around 18 months when they would be getting rid of them anyway. Um, and in my first one in Ohio, we did five of those birds and four of them had tumors on their reproductive tracks. like just out of an interesting, and those were not ones that were grabbed. We literally just ran over to the coop of the farm we were on and grabbed five birds out of the hen house. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, it wasn't like they picked these five because they were on the desk door. Do you know what I mean? Like, um, it was part of my decision to start doing standard bread in the first place. <laughs> um, and then the other place we did it, um, two of them, two of them had tumors and one of them had never laid a egg in its life even though it was from that sort of thing so it's interesting like you said to just find out what's inside of them even when you know <clears throat> i've seen tumors in other places but generally when they lay right up tight to the spine spinal cord um those birds are all hunched up and getting ready to die in the next 24 48 hours okay. um the other lesions and the generic term is leukosis but when when you find cancer in other parts of the Look, I think cancer in commercial birds is way more common than people want to really talk about, but it's, I mean, the, the breeding of that is so tight and repetitious, and I don't think, you know, they're not culling for those sort of things. They don't even detect it until the birds, you know, past, you know, it's about ready to go out, like you're, like the birds you did, Karen. Yeah. So, all right. I don't, I don't know that we'll know this answer either, but let's try for Laura. Does anything know anybody about, oh, I got that totally wrong, coryza tumors from vaccines or otherwise? I do not know. I, no, I don't I, either. I have not seen that or heard that connection. So, all right. Well, all Rip, right. Was, Rip was very patient with us, letting us go along. So. I, 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 He's good. He's getting over it. We're stretching his rubber band for him. He, he's See, getting over Y'all keep trying to lay that on me. I don't, I don't care if we go two hours. Okay. Well, see, he waits to eat supper until after the show. So That's it's getting late, right? It's 8 o'clock here. <laughs> right? <clears throat> and the older we get, our timing for supper becomes more and more important. <laughs> That's why you eat first. Yeah, right. I'm done. I'm just going home for popcorn and ice cream. So... <laughs> Well, I do have one other announcement before we close. Um, I have heard from many of you, you would like a podcast format for these shows. Well, YouTube has now allowed creating podcasts. Um, and all of our live streams are now in that YouTube podcast format. So you can go to our YouTube channel homepage 
click on playlist and you can see the first thing there is podcast of live streams uh, so you can now listen to us to your heart's content what are you shaking your head for here i'm laughing at bud and bud and his wife for eating chicken and dumplings while watching this yeah, oh good for you bud save me a bowl <laughs> Like Jeff said, I don't eat until after the show's over. <laughs> All right. But either one of you folks have anything to share with us? No, I I, I learned a lot. So, and, yep. <clears throat> Very good. Well, it was a show. ladies and gentlemen, I, we hope you've enjoyed the show. We hope you have, like Jeff, learned a lot tonight. Um, we always have fun doing them. In case you couldn't tell, and we enjoyed it. It was hard for us to be quiet for that long, though. I know it. <laughs> it was terrible. I, I kept wanting to butt in. Yeah. <laughs> so until next time, we appreciate you. We love you. Uh, we appreciate all the kind comments that came in tonight about how much you, you learned from our shows and, and how much you appreciate them. So thank you for that. So until next week. No, next two weeks. Have fun, enjoy your birds, and enjoy life. Be kind to one another. We'll see you in two weeks. Bye-bye.